So can we all give a round of applause for a very impromptu speaker? <laughs> Hello. I am so sorry that I am not who you came here to see, but you're getting me instead. I'm going to take this off because it will distract me. Okay. Hi. My name is Jennifer. I'm a student. I am just about to graduate from my undergraduate degree at Glasgow Caledonian University, studying digital security and forensics. Um, and in September, I'm going to be starting my master's degree, studying advanced computer science with artificial intelligence at University of Strathclyde. These slides haven't really been edited since the last time I did this talk, which was Thursday, which was also my first ever talk. So you're going to have to forgive me if I ramble a little bit at the start, because it was intended for an a event that happens in a pub basement, so it's maybe a little more chill. Um, I just covered that. My name is Jennifer. Um, thanks for sitting in and listening, even though I'm not here. I'm not who you came here to see. Some fun facts about me, I am certified in Japanese, not at a very high level before you get excited. I am just certified at Japanese N4. These fun facts were in here because I thought, well, normally most people do talks and they have a lovely big slide and it's got, you know, like, oh, I started working here and it's got arrows and oh, I got promoted and then I moved company and I'm a student so I don't have any of that experience. So you're getting some fun facts instead. Second fun fact about me, I was an orchestral percussionist, not anymore because they're not the kind of instruments you can really keep in your house. Uh, if you play the flute or you play the clarinet or the saxophone, you have a flute and you bring it to rehearsal and then you go home with it. Um, when you're an orchestral percussionist, you play huge big instruments like my favourite timpani drums and you don't get to take them home. So I was an orchestral percussionist, technically not anymore, but if anyone does have any timpani drums in their house, I would be more than happy to come. I promise I don't take up much space. This is a very impromptu talk. On Thursday, this said, this is my first talk. But technically, it's not my first talk anymore. So it's a very impromptu talk. I have not, well, I say it's my, it was my first talk. I have spoken before at university events. My audience is generally high school students and their parents. Thursday was my first time speaking to a technical audience. Um, this is my second time speaking to a technical audience. Hooray! So what am I going to talk about? I want to talk about my honours project, which hasn't been marked yet. So, you know, maybe I will be issuing an apology on social media very shortly when I get my results out and they're maybe not quite as good and you've all sat here and listened to me for half an hour. I'm going to be talking about polymorphic viruses, which are like normal viruses, but worse. I'm going to be talking about deep learning, which is a type of artificial intelligence. And then I'm going to be talking about this one really cool technique for representing viruses that I found right at the start of my honours project and then kind of went, oh, that's really cool, actually, and then spent a year convincing my supervisor that it was definitely really important that I use this one technique. I promise, I promise it's really important. So malware is bad. Viruses um, are not very good. You don't really want them hanging about in your network. They cause a lot of damage, steal data, damage networks, all that kind of stuff. You don't really want them hanging about. But if you think regular viruses are worse, polymorphic vir or poly if, you if you think regular viruses are bad, polymorphic viruses are even worse. Polymorphic viruses are a certain type of virus which contain a software component called a polymorphic engine. What this does is it can change certain parts of the code after every single virus infection. Meaning you could be in a room full of computers with the same polymorphic virus on every one and the function of the virus will be the same. However, there will be slight bits of code that are different. The very first polymorphic virus was called um, 1260 and it was released onto the world in 1990. So it's not necessarily a new thing but I think something that is gaining more attention nowadays. Don't ask me why it's called 1260, because I did this talk for my mum. I said, sit down, mum, I've got a talk on Thursday. Please sit down and listen to me doing this. And the first question she asked was, why is it called 1260? And I was like, I don't know. And I couldn't find it anywhere. So we're just going to go with that's what it's called, and who knows why. Now, I am not going to stand here and look at this and pretend to you like I know what every single bit of it means because it would be a lie. Um, but we have comments to help us. So anywhere that you see it says optional variable junk. 
This whole bit is part of a decryption routine for a polymorphic virus. And where it says optional variable junk, that is a part where it will be kind of randomly inserted, random code that's not going to actually have an effect on the virus itself, but it's going to slightly change something in the code that's not really actually important, and that can be randomized. Why is it important? Well, we need to be able to detect malware um, for obvious reasons, I hope. There are lots of different ways of detecting malware. One of the most common is signature-based detection. The way this works, every file has a signature, which is a unique piece of data that uniquely represents that file. Signature-based detection works by having a big long list of um, signatures that it knows are related to viruses. And it will look at this signature that it gets, and it will look at its list, and it will look at it and go, right, is it in my list? Yes, it is. It's a virus. Is it not in my list? It's not a virus, which in theory would be great. But as we've just discussed, with polymorphic viruses, the code changes after every infection. Meaning if we go back to that room full of computers, you're in a room, every computer has the same polymorphic virus, the signature will be different on every single one. We also have behavior-based detection, which if you couldn't tell from the name, um, basically tries to detect malware based on its behavior. So what kind of files it's accessing, all that kind of thing. These are better than signature-based detection for polymorphic malware, but um, a lot of the time it has been found that they have quite a high false positive rate. So what are we going to do about that? Well, we're going to do something no one has ever done before and talk about AI. Um, within AI, there are two big kind of groups, machine learning and deep learning. One of the biggest differences between these two is feature selection. So features in an AI are the important data points. So if you had a machine learning algorithm that was finding out, trying to predict the price of a house, your features would be things like the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, is it close to a train station, all that kind of thing. With deep learning, you don't have to do any of that, which is great for me doing a project because I didn't have to think about it. Um, the other thing that deep learning does, which is what makes it so good at picking out features by itself, is that it looks, well, it tries to replicate something like a human brain. Now, I bet when you left your house to come to La Tour de Hack today, you didn't think you were going to be getting a biology lesson, but here we are. So at the top, we have a biological neuron. They get input at this side from other neurons. Um, the nucleus in the middle is the, th the kind of the thinking where the, where the processes happen in a neuron. And then at the other end, you've got the axon terminals, which are where the output goes to other neurons. On the bottom, we have an artificial neuron. Inputs, processes in the middle, and output to other neurons also called perceptrons when we're talking about artificial intelligence. So you could say artificial neuron or perceptron, it's kind of just personal preference, I think. So you can see how similar these are, and when they're built up, you can imagine how it would maybe replicate something like a human brain. So when we have these in biology, they are called biological neural networks. In AI, they are called artificial neural networks. And there are lots and lots of different types of, convolution, of neural networks. But I was using convolutional neural networks. Now, this is related to that very, very cool technique that I mentioned earlier. But essentially, we are going to be dealing with images. And I mean, like, pictures. I don't mean images as in an image of a phone. I mean image as in pictures. So we'll get on to that shortly. But just know we're using convolutional neural networks because we are dealing with images. We're going to talk a little bit now about how images are represented, because this will help us later. If you recognize this, I'm sorry, it means you've probably done some kind of MNIST classification before with handwritten digits. I think it's kind of baby's first AI, you need to classify handwritten digits. So you can see it's quite a blocky image, there are lots of pixels, and every single pixel will have a certain value. If it is zero, that pixel will be pure black. If it's 255, that pixel will be pure white. And if it's anything in between, it will be some kind of gray. 
and you can see how that looks without the shading behind it. So although it is represented as an image, it is just really a big matrix of values. With grayscale, you're very lucky, you only need to worry about one channel. With coloured images, RGB, you need to worry about three. Thankfully for my project, I was being lazy, so I only used grayscale, which meant less work for me. With the CNN, um, I'm not going to go into loads of detail because it gets complicated. And it's one of those things I feel where if you're interested, then it's really interesting to learn about all the intricate maths behind it. And if you're not interested or you don't know enough about it, it's really boring. So I'm not going to bore anyone. Um, instead, I'm just going to very briefly talk about how it works. So you have an image that is your input. You don't use the image as input in the sense of here is an image. You use the image as input in the sense of here is a matrix of all the pixel values. So all the pixel values will, will go into the input layer and that's what's used as your features. In the middle, you have your hidden layers, which are where all kinds of data transformations happen. I'll cover one of them in the next slide, but there are lots of different ones. It's really complicated and, again, kind of boring if you're not super into it. And then after all the data transformations have happened to try and make the classification easier, in the output layer, there will be however many nodes, however many nodes there are will be however many classes you have. So in this case, this model was to classify images between dog, bird, and cat. So there were three nodes in the output layer. In my case, they were classifying between benign and malware. So there were two output nodes. This is where it gets a little mathsy, although not too complicated, I promise. One of the big data transformations that happens in a convolutional neural network is kernel filtering. Basically how this works is you have your input, which is your, like, your pixel values, and you have a kernel, which is a fixed size, and it will have numbers could be to do, you could set the numbers or normally the machine will set the numbers. And this basically just gets placed over top of the input. And there are lots of different ways that these values can then turn into the output. In this case, it's multiplication. I've seen ones where it's like the maximum instead, things like that. So the kernel gets placed over the input. And in this case, it's multiplying, but they're all zeros. So that's kind of boring. So we're going to move along a little bit. And then we're going to have a one in the bottom corner. That will get multiplied. In this case, it'll get multiplied by the three, which is also in the bottom corner. And then we have three in the output. If we move along again a little bit, you've got a one and a two in the bottom. One times two is two. Two times three is six. I'm sure we can all do that. It turns out to be eight. And that's how we get this input. Now, the reason we do this is basically to try and reduce the feature map and to make it easier, less values for the AI to try and deal with makes it easier to classify. We need to have some kind of input. Unfortunately, I can't just chuck a whole bunch of malware files at it and expect it to know what to do. Um, I had to have some kind of input, which is where my very cool technique comes in. It was published by these lovely folk from the University of California in 2011, and they published this as a method for visualizing images, visualizing malware and other files as grayscale images, which can then be used for classification purposes. So I'm going to run you through the steps of how that worked. Step one, gather your executable files. I had just under 18,000 files for this project, um, nine, rough, just under 9,000 malware files, just under 9,000 benign files, all stored on my computer at home in a virtual machine. You can imagine I didn't share with anyone else living in my home that I had 9,000 virus files stored on my computer. The university weren't very willing to let me download 9,000 viruses, so I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do it at home. That's fine too. So I've got my files. Step two was to turn those executable files into text files containing binary. Binary in this case, not meaning binary code, but meaning literal binary ones and zeros. This was one small snippet of nearly 18,000 files. So again, my hard drive hates me. Um, 
uh, there's not much to say. Lots and lots of bytes of binary. And if you understood what I was talking about earlier with the RGB images or the grayscale images and how they work, then you've maybe kind of got an idea of where I might be going with this. Step three is to turn those text files containing binary into grayscale images by using the intermediate decimal values. So we have binary. That equals to a number, decimal number, between 0 and 255 which, if you remember back, we also had, for grayscale images, lots of numbers between 0 and 255. So once we've got all of these then become our decimal values between 0 and 255, we put them into a nice grid, into the proper format that we want, and then we get something like this, which I've been told needs to be made into a Christmas jumper. This is um, a representation of a virus as a grayscale image. This is a locker virus, which is a type of ransomware. And I, again, almost 18,000 of these. And these are what, these are the images that were used as the input to the AI. Just to pull it all together, when I mentioned polymorphic viruses all being very similar, these are six different files, all from the same polymorphic virus family. And you can see they're pretty similar. Um, maybe the top row and then the one right at that end is quite a thick black bar at the bottom. These two, maybe not so much. Um, and the top two in that corner, you can see kind of almost like a zigzag. So you can see differences. As humans, we can see differences. But you also can see all of the similarities that these have. It's very clear that they're related. So for my project, I had to avoid bias. And I used three different convolutional neural networks. These were VGG16, ResNet50, and DenseNet201. These, um, they're different in some ways. For example, ResNet50 has some layers that can like loop back and connect and skip things. Um, the main difference between them is the number of layers, so 16, 50, and 201. So after all of the analysis, well, first of all, I had to obviously train the models. So I had my three models, and they were trained on all my, well, not trained on all 18,000, because we have training data sets and testing data sets, but a good amount of the data was used to train these models. And I was training for months. I was like changing all different values. I was changing things like the learning rate, so how quickly the models would learn, and the number of training epochs that would run. I was doing it for all three, and it took me forever. And then I had to analyze it all. All my results I had to analyze, and I used some of these metrics. Um, the most important one that I think that I'm going to talk a little bit about is the confusion matrix. It's a really good visualization of how well the model is doing. And it also, when you have a confusion matrix, those values then become the formula for the other metrics. So in this confusion matrix, we have down the side the actual values. So was a certain file actually benign or actually a virus? And along the bottom, we have what the model predicted it to be, a benign file or a virus file. So we start up the top, and it looks pretty good. We've got 2,666 files that were benign and were predicted benign, and then only 29 that it got wrong, which is really great, and you're thinking, wow, that's fantastic. And then you look at the bottom half of the graph, and it's like, oh, God, what happened? That's about... <laughs> Thanks for the laughter. I appreciate that. Um, so almost a half and half split for a virus, a little bit more correctly identified, but a really huge number incorrectly identified. So this particular model that generated this confusion matrix was really, really bad at detecting viruses. Um, a better example is this one. This was one of my better models. So again, we have really high numbers in the top corner, 2,548. A slightly higher number of incorrectly classified benign files but it's a sacrifice that I was willing to make to see the much better results on the bottom half. 2,409 correctly predicted viruses compared to only 282 incorrect. I think we can all agree that this is really bad in comparison to this. 
so after I did all my analysis, used confusion matrices and then used things like accuracy, precision and recall, worked it all out, had it all in a data sheet, it was looking lovely. I eventually came to the conclusion that VGG16 in this case was the best one for my scenario. So at this point, I'm thinking, fantastic, I've done it, I've finished my project. I have got a model that is really good. Well, I say good. My supervisor would yell at me for saying good because she was like, it has to be the most efficient. Well, it's the same thing. It's just, I'm just not going to sit here and say, yes, I found the most efficient model. It was the best model. <laughs> same thing. But I found it. I've used a technique that's really good for defending against polymorphic malware. I'm sorted. I've done it. I take it to my supervisor and I say, look what I've done. Aren't you happy? I've got my model. I spent so long building this code and training it and analyzing all my details. Do you like it? And she goes, yeah, it's good. And she goes, oh, but you could make a website. And I'm like, oh, a website? Is this, is this not enough? And she's like, well, you kind of want to have a finished product for your project. And I'm kind of thinking, or my three models that I did all that stuff on, is that not enough of a finished product? And she goes, mm, I think you should make a website, which if you need that translated as supervisor speak for make the website. So I made the ugliest website known to mankind. Um, I mean, she's beautiful, isn't she? And this is very basic, um, HTML and CSS on the front. I wrote my code in Python, so the Python was hosted on the back end using Flask to enable that connection between them. You could submit a file, an .exe file, and it would go to the back end. It would run through the code, first of all, to turn it into a grayscale image. Then it would be passed on to where that one good model that I found was the best would then be put into the code and it ran through that predicted and then would send back to the user if it was benign or a virus. And at this point, I'm thinking, right, fantastic, I've done it. Website, there you go, do you like it? And she goes, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, you know what you could really do is see if it's a virus, you could make it flash red. And if it's not a virus, it could flash green. And I put my foot down at that point because I still had 10,000 words worth of a dissertation to write. So it doesn't flash, unfortunately. You'd be glad to know for anyone with epilepsy in the room, nothing is going to flash. Um, but just to prove that it wasn't total minimal effort, I did add in some file extension validation just to be like, oh, well, if it's not a .exe file, it'll come up and it'll say not a valid file type. You can't do that. In the grand scheme of thing, things, file extension validation can be bypassed quite easily. But I just thought, just to prove that it's really not like the lowest effort I could possibly do, I'll add this in. Now, when I did this talk on Thursday, um, I had someone come up to me at the end, and they were like, oh, did you intentionally make it the color that they use at Disneyland so that you don't see things? And I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. And then he pulled out this photo of, apparently at Disneyland, they use a very similar shade of green to like smooth over things like construction work. So I unintentionally made this the color of ignoring. So we're all gonna hope that when I submitted this, we're gonna hope that when my supervisor and my second marker look at this, they're gonna just go, oh, but the models were so good, it's okay, don't worry about it. And they just kind of forget it exists. Unintentionally. <laughs> Unintentionally. I genuinely didn't know. And then he was like, look at this. And I was like, oh, that's almost exact, actually. It's pretty impressive, I think. I know I'm not who you came here to see. I hope you enjoyed yourself anyway. I hope you maybe learned something. Thank you very much.